Father, your love is amazing. That you would love us enough to send Jesus into this world to suffer and die, to redeem us from our sins, to deliver us from hell. It is too incredible to fully grasp. And so this morning, we just stand in your presence and we lift up our praise, we lift up our thanksgiving, and we tell you that we love you. And Father, this morning, we pray that your spirit would penetrate our hearts, that your truth would change our lives, that we would sense your presence and your love, even as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take uh, your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the, the Gospel of John chapter 6. Uh, John chapter 6 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, uh, that's okay. We've got Bibles all over the, the church and the pews around you. Just grab one of those. And uh, tell you what, if you need a Bible, why don't you just take one of those. We want you to have the Word of God, use the Word of God, let it, let it penetrate your life. Hey, before we dive into the text today, uh, let me just share something with you. You know, in January, we started uh, our fifth worship service at 4.30 on Saturday. And, and, uh, and I know some of you have visited it, and this is your service. So you're like, yay, I'm glad that uh, they have Saturday service. But uh, I just want to tell you that since we started that, it has been a tremendous success. We have been averaging over 1,300 attenders uh, every weekend uh, as we've, since we started that. And that's just uh, one of those things that is amazing. It's 10% more than the year before. And uh, God just keeps sending us people. We get to celebrate life change in that. And... Uh, And that is cool. But, uh, but we're also diving into the summer. And uh, I don't, you guys are, are from Havis, so you know everything changes in the summer. You know, uh, the pace changes, schedules change, uh, hours of businesses change, uh, all that kind of stuff. Anybody who can uh, gets out of town for at least uh, some time. And, uh, and so we're going we're gonna to make a change for the summer. After all, one of our core values here at Calvary is change because we believe it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay where you are. And so for the summer, we're going to have a summer worship schedule. And uh, it's, only, it's not going to affect you guys because Sunday schedule stays the same. But Saturday is going to switch back to one service for the summer months. And that's going to be at 5 o'clock. We're not doing a 4.30 or a 6. We're going to meet in the middle and do a 5 o'clock. And so uh, if you're one of those that drops in when you can't be here Sunday morning on Saturday, be aware of that. Uh, or if you want to check it out, then, then do that. That's going to be happening for the summer. Just wanted to keep you guys informed so you would know. And so when you tell somebody, hey, come check out our church. we got Saturday services, you know that we have summer hours as well. We're going to put a sign out front and all that kind of stuff just so you guys will know. Starts Memorial Day because <laughs> doesn't summer start Memorial Day weekend? Uh, it's when everything starts getting weird around here anyway. So, uh, so it starts, uh, starts Memorial Day. So just make note of that as well. Hey, we are continuing our Soul Food Taste and See series where we're looking at biblical passages about food, talking about how we can feed our souls. And uh, anyone want to guess what the uh, subject matter is today after you walked in through that wonderful smelling foyer and kind of catch that odor as it lingers in here? Uh, what are we talking about? Yeah, the bread of life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life in John chapter 6. And uh, it, it, some of you are really wishing that you'd eaten something before you came here, right? Because you walk through that and you're like, oh, I'm so hungry. I hope the service is short. Uh, but uh, now you're, you're already thinking about where you're going to get that you know, brunch at after service, and that's cool. Uh, but uh, I wasn't sure how to approach the subject since bread's gotten such a bad reputation lately. You know, it's kind of hard. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. And, and let's just admit it. We all love bread, uh, even if we pretend not to eat it anymore. <laughs> right? Because it's like, oh, no, I don't, I'm trying to cut out the carbs. I'm not eating the bread. Until we show up at Olive Garden, right? <laughs> they put the breadsticks in front of you, and I'm out. You know, anybody with me on that one? You know? Yeah, it's like, uh, what diet? What low carb? What? Uh, so I thought about calling the sermon... Um, how to eat the bread of life on a low-carb diet. <laughs> but uh, I thought maybe a good one with uh, gluten-free Jesus. Uh, <laughs> you know, the theological implications of being allergic to the bread of life. Uh, but uh, I think we'll just stick with bread of life. Uh, it works better. Here's the truth, though. God desires to nourish our souls. And, and he offers us the bread of life. And, and, and that makes sense when we understand the significance of bread. 
significance of bread, uh, especially to people. Uh, Jesus chose this symbolism of bread be, uh, because of its importance in everyday life to people. Uh, Almost every culture in the world uh, that you visit has some kind of staple carbohydrate type, bread type thing that, that is a, a main provision of their diet. It may be rice, it may be noodles, uh, it may be uh, pounded yams, it may be mgali, it, it may be pita or tortillas or bread. The people who are listening to Jesus and having this conversation in John chapter 6, they were a bread oriented people. That, that was what uh, they lived on, and, and so that was what was important to them. When they heard Jesus talking about, I am the bread of life, what they heard was, he's the staple. He, he's, the, he's the most important function in terms of their diet. Because the people listening to Jesus, they didn't have meat except at the big religious holidays where they had to have lamb or, or something like that. And, and so they were people who subsisted on bread. And so if they knew they had bread, they knew they were going to stay alive because they had something to eat. And so Jesus says to them, I'm the bread of life. Significant. Uh, and then we need to understand the significance of bread in Scripture. Because the Bible talks about bread over and over and over again. Uh, just some of the references. Think about this. In the Exodus event. The biggest event in the Old Testament uh, uh, in, in the history of the Jewish people, they are delivered from slavery out of Egypt uh, and given uh, the promised land. And while they're in the wilderness, wandering about, running out of food, uh, God provided them with this really cool thing. You guys know what it is? Manna. manna. Yeah, God gave them manna, and, and they called that bread from heaven. And, and so bread, gee, well, that's two services where that thing's just popped for no reason. Uh, and so he, he talked about the, the manna. And then you guys all know where Jesus was born, right? He was born in... <laughs> Man, no, everybody like says that one. Is it Bethlehem? <laughs> really? I, I mean, you guys all went like really quiet suddenly. And it's amazing. Every service does that. You know, if you're not sure, just sing the Christmas songs to yourself. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, yeah. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We all know that if we think about it. And, and, and do, you, do you know what Bethlehem means in Hebrew? It means house of bread. Beit Lahem. And, and so uh, Jesus was born in the house of bread. He said, I'm the bread of life. And, and then, of course, there's the temptation of Jesus where after 40 days of fasting and he's out in the wilderness alone, Satan comes to him. He knows he's hungry and he says, hey, if you really are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And if Jesus answers and says, uh, it is written, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So, uh, you know, all of these are part of it. And then, of course, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. And at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. You see, the significance of bread in, to people's lives in the Bible. Uh, and so to grasp Jesus' statement that he's the bread of life it is huge. We need to know that significance of bread. And, and then in, in the setting that we're going to be looking at in John chapter 6, we need to know that the people following Jesus wanted the magic bread. Wanted the magic bread. Uh, John chapter 6, pick up verse 26. Uh, I'm going to wander through this text uh, and tell the story a little bit. Uh, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves of the bread. What's he talking about? Well, if you look back at the beginning of John chapter 6, you see the story where Jesus fed the 5,000. And, you know, so Jesus was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and the crowds came to him and he put the disciples kind of to the test. Like, hey, how are we going to feed these people? You guys need to feed them. And they go, Jesus, we don't have enough food. We don't have enough money uh, to buy bread. Uh, but we do have five loaves and two fish. And so Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he multiplied them and he fed over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. Loaves of bread, little, and two fish. Doesn't matter how big the loaves were, right? <laughs> Feeding 5,000 people with... You know, five loaves of bread. Yeah, good luck with that. So, you know, that's got to be like the coolest miracle ever, right? Because, you know, for the crowds. Because he was there and you were there. If you'd been there, you'd be like, oh, that was cool. I wonder if he's going to do it again tomorrow. I'm going to show back up. I'm not going to bring any food then either. 
see what Jesus does. It'll be awesome. And, and after the miracle, Jesus sends the crowds away. He goes up on the mountain to pray. The disciples head across the lake in the boat. And then in the middle of the night, Jesus comes walking across the lake. Now, that is absolutely the coolest miracle, but there only a few people got to see it. And, and uh, he gets to the other side, and the people realize that he's gone. They chase him down, and they find him, and they come to him, and they want more bread. Do it again. Give us the magic bread. Come on, that was so cool. Do it again. And, and, uh, and, and Jesus kind of puts them off and says, you know, if you really knew who I was and things like that. And this is what they say in verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Because our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Yeah. Come on, Jesus. You say, you think you're all that? Well, you know, God gave our, our forefathers manna to eat. And here's Jesus' response. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, and the people got offended. If you read on down, they, they start going things like, well, hey, what do, you, what do you mean you're the bread of life? You're Joseph's boy. What's all this talk about coming down from heaven about? We know where you're from. You're from Nazareth. We know your parents. We know your brothers and sisters. Come on. Who do you think you are, really? And so Jesus gets really blunt, and, and he responds to them, and he challenges them. Look at verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This grossed the people out. Hey, come on, they, they were against cannibalism. You guys are too, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that wasn't convincing. I'm just going to say this. I just asked this whole crowd if you're against cannibalism, and like four people said, yeah, we're against it. <laughs> I'm going to be careful the rest of you had invited me over for dinner. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have the pastor for dinner. Uh, so, you know, they were grossed out by it, and we're laughing and stuff because we understood what Jesus means, right? On this side of the story, we get it. Because we know that Jesus is going to institute the communion. What we celebrate is communion. There at the Last Supper when he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat the bread. This cup is my blood which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. Do this. And what he's saying is, look, if you're a part of my family, if you're a part of my followers, if you're invested in me and in my kingdom and you participate, you partake in this, then I'm going to raise you up. We know he didn't actually mean you're going to eat my actual body and my, drink my actual blood. And, and so he, he's, he shares that with them. And the people, they got offended by that and, and they got hurt by that. And in verse 66, listen to what it says. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. People stopped following Jesus because they didn't like what he said and thought the teaching was too hard and too difficult to bear. They stopped following Jesus. Why? Why would they stop following this guy they've seen do miracles and fed the multitudes and, and it teaches so amazingly? Here's why. Because they weren't really interested in Jesus. They weren't really interested in Jesus. They just wanted the stuff that Jesus gave them. They wanted magic bread. They were following Jesus around and going, hey, come on, when are you going to do the next trick? When are you going to do the next miracle? When are you going to give us the magic bread again? Hey, Jesus, I've got a friend over here that, that is sick, and, and we want you to heal him. Or my family member is sick. Would you heal them? Hey, Jesus, you know, we hate Rome, and you seem like you're a guy that could like, be a political leader and maybe raise up a rebellion and fight against Rome and give us our freedom. You see, they wanted the things that Jesus could do, they weren't really interested in Jesus. 
not as a person. And to all of their wants and all their clamorings, Jesus offers himself. He says, I'm the bread of life. This is what you get. You get me. So let me ask you a question. Do you want Jesus or do you want what Jesus can give you? Do you want Jesus or do you want the the stuff that Jesus can give you? In other words, what's your magic bread? What is it that you want Jesus to do for you? Because we all come to God with petitions and requests and, and he's not offended by that. You know, uh, hey, God, you know that I'm sick or, you know, my loved one's sick and we want you to heal us. God, you know that we're desperate. We're, we, you know, I lost my job. I need a job. We need resources. We need something to pay the bills to feed my kids. God, help us. God, you know that, that I, I, I need a new job or I need a raise or, or I, I need some guidance. God, I need these different things for you to do. Would you fix my marriage? Would you, you know, get my kids off of drugs? Would you do, some, do these things for me? And sometimes it's easier to get focused on the gifts than the gift giver. And all we're talking about, all we're thinking about are the things that Jesus can do for us. And the truth is, if we love Jesus and if we follow Jesus and if we serve Jesus, he gives amazing gifts and blesses our lives incredibly. But honestly, if the blessings went away, If it became difficult and painful to follow Jesus, would you stick with him? Or would you be like those in verse 66 that said, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him? Because it's easy to love the blessings more than the one who gives them. Yet, Jesus is the substance of life. Jesus is the substance of life. That's what he's talking about when he says, look, I am the bread of life. I am the nourishment for your soul. I am the food that you can feast on. I am that which will fill you. He's life. Look again at verses 35 through 40 and see what what Jesus does to us and with us and for us as we follow him. Not just for what he offers, but because he's the Savior. First of all, Jesus will satisfy. Verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus will satisfy. Um, Now, obviously, Jesus is not talking about uh, physical hunger and thirst because we're followers of Jesus Christ and yet we get hungry. In fact, a lot of you were hungry when you walked in because of the smell and you're like going, where are we gonna eat lunch? So we get hungry. I get thirsty. I'm thirsty all the time. And yes, I would really love to have a Diet Pepsi. And no, I'm not having one. Okay? So, hey, look, it's just stuff to, to drink, right? And, and, and yeah, it tastes better than the stuff I'm drinking, but that, that's just life. And, and so, you know, we, we get hungry, we get thirsty. So Jesus isn't being literal. What he's talking about is feeding our souls, filling our souls, satisfying our souls. Because every one of us has a hunger within And we try to fill that. We try to satisfy our lives with things and with people and with events and with achievements and with success. And we pour all those things into our life hoping that it's going to satisfy. And it doesn't. It's kind of like going to a cheap buffet. Anyone ever been to a cheap buffet besides me? Yeah. I bet more of you have. You just didn't want to raise your hand and admit it because you're planning on going to one after the service. And... uh, so when we were kids, our parents always took us to cheap buffets. Four boys, they'd walk in the door and go, you know, child's menu, you know, price for these guys. And they'd look at us. And, my, and I remember saying, get your money's worth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can get my money's worth, you know. I go in there, you know, and brown plate number four, dessert number three, you know, and go home and then puke all night. Because uh, I was the puker in the family, you know. And uh, it took me years to fi- finally figure out, hey, if I don't like gorge myself on this stuff, then I won't get sick. And, uh, but you know, uh, you, you grow up and you go to cheap buffets and, 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 and this is what happens to me. And I don't know if this is your experience or not, but I go to a buffet and I, and I just tell you right now, I hate buffets. You go to a buffet 
And, and what do you do? You wander through the line, you go, oh, that looks good. I wonder how it'll taste. Oh, what about that? Now put some of that on there. And you load up, right? And then you go back to your table and you eat it and you find the stuff that kind of tasted good and the other stuff isn't. And then you go back and get some more of the stuff that tasted good. Oh, you see something else and try that. And next thing you know, you're like, you, you ate out to here and you're like staggering out of the restaurant or rolling you out of the restaurant and you're going, oh, I ate too much and none of it was what I wanted. None of it was what I wanted. It wasn't the taste. It, wasn't, it didn't satisfy. Yes, I'm full, but I'm not satisfied. And, and, and that's what we do with our lives, with all of the stuff and all of the things and all of the events and all of the, the success we're trying for and the relationships that we have. We're trying to fill our lives and nothing, but nothing is gonna bring peace and contentment except filling your life with Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying, and that's what's reality in our lives. And, and most of us in here would nod our heads and go, yes, we know that, and we sing about that, and we talk about that, and we say, yes, I want to fill my life with Jesus. And then we go home, and we still fantasize about winning the lottery. Or we fantasize about becoming famous or about meeting the perfect person. Like that is going to satisfy us. Jesus will satisfy. He's the one who can make your soul content. Nothing else can. Is Jesus enough for you? Or are you clamoring for more? Only Jesus will satisfy and Jesus will keep you safe. Jesus will keep you safe. Verse 37, Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Uh, you guys notice that we like security I mean, in our culture, I'm not sure how other cultures are, but we like security. We want security for our houses, right? So we put locks on the doors. It's not enough. So then we put alarms on our houses. That's not enough. So we've got firearms waiting in case someone, you know, breaks into our little fortresses. Because we like security. And then we like security for our person. So we, you know, get our concealed weapons permit so we can carry. And, and then, you know, we take self-defense classes so we can beat somebody up that attacks us. And, or, or, you know, we carry panic buttons on our, our car keys or mace on our car keys so we can, you know, blast people when they come. Right? Got to have security. We want security in relationships. We want to know that the person that we're loving and investing in loves us back and is committed to that relationship the way that we are. We want security. And here's the thing. Jesus provides security. Do you hear what he says? He says, I will not cast you out. I will not abandon you. I will not betray you. I will not reject you. He'll keep you safe. Now, when you hear that, understand he's not talking about keeping you safe from physical harm. Uh, he's not promising you that no one's ever going to hurt you or, or do anything you know, evil to you physically. Because we know that martyrs were real then and martyrs are real now. People are suffering and dying that love Jesus. But here's the thing. He says, look, uh, don't worry about that. I got this. I'll keep you safe. If you're mine, I will keep you. And I've got a place for you. And, and, and I'll take you there. And I'll hold on to you. And nothing in this world is going to separate you from me. So if you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are his forever. Forever. That relationship is eternal. And I want you to live in the security of that. I want you to live in the, the comfort of that, the, 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 the relational, you know, just peace that he gives you, saying that, look, I got this. You're mine. You're safe. Now, I know some of you are going, yeah, well, you know, um, I I'm too faithless uh, to have that security. I'm still afraid. Am I going to be good enough to make it? No, you're not going to be good enough to make it because you were faithless. Okay, we are. We're faithless. We're sinners. We're going to betray God. We're going to turn our back on him. At some point, we're going to do that. It may be for a moment. It may be for a year. I don't know. It may be for decades. But we're going to do that. And here's the thing. Even though we're faithless, God is faithful. And Jesus says, I'm not going to cast you out. You can live in the, in the security of grace because Jesus promises, I got you. I got you. And, and some of you are like, oh, you know, I, I, I just not comfortable, you know, uh, believing that. And some of you have been raised to just, you know, buy into the doubts, buy into the, you're never gonna be secure. And I'm telling you, this is not based on me and you. This is based on Jesus and his word. Jesus said, I got you. He'll keep you safe. And then Jesus will raise you up. 
Verses 39 and 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus says, you believe in me, you love me, you follow me, I'll take you to heaven. I will take you to heaven. This world may be cruel, it may be painful, it may be filled with sorrow and loss, but there is more than this life. He says, look, delight in me and I will take you to a place beyond your imagination. You know, where all of the evil in this world is done away with and and all of the pains that you carry in your body are no more and and all of the brokenness that you have felt is done away with. And all things are made new. That's his promise to us. That's why he's asking us to hold on to him as the bread of life. He says, look, I'll raise you up. But here's the cool thing. He doesn't, it's not just raise you up someday. It's raise you up now. Scripture over and over and over again says, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may exalt you. That he may raise you up in his time. Which means that if you'll go ahead and say, Jesus, I want you more than anything else. I'm going to hold on to you more than anything else. You're enough for me. Then what he's going to do is he's going to go ahead and and exalt you in his way and his time. He's going to promote you. Instead of you working so hard, worrying about promoting yourself and achieving success in whatever way you think you're achieving it. God himself will make sure that you are lifted up if you surrender completely to him. He'll raise you up. That's what Jesus does. When we hold on to him, he satisfies our souls, he keeps us safe, he raises us up. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Is Jesus enough for you? 1987, I got to take my uh, first overseas mission trip. Went to Kenya, Africa. And uh, I was 25 years old, seminary student, uh, on fire for God. I mean, I was ready to take on hell with a squirt gun. Uh, I mean, it was just, I wanted to go and share the gospel with people who'd never heard about Jesus because that was just like so cool. And I wanted to go and help these people who are, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ living in abject poverty. And uh, got there and, you know, 25 years old. So they, they took me, another guy, another guy, and they dropped us off uh, with a tent uh, 40 gallons of drinking water and a porta potty, you know, because we were out in uh, the wilds. And uh, oh, yeah, and they gave us a machete too uh, for the snakes. And so, uh, just telling you how it was, not trying to recruit you to go. And, uh, <laughs> and so there we were, and, and, uh, and they dropped us off in a place called, you know, Chasimba, which means land of the lion. But they said, don't worry about lions, worry about snakes. And, uh, and we spent our days, you know, walking from village to village, sharing the gospel with people. And, and they responded to the gospel like I never imagined. And, and God was just like showing me what he could do in this world. And, and at night, we'd have church services in this little stick and mud church that, that had a tin roof on it. And, uh, and it was just a, a wild and wonderful experience. And one night, uh, after the church services, uh, God just broke me. He just, he just broke me. Uh, because after the church services were over and, and the guests went home, the, the people of the church just stayed there singing by lantern light. They were singing praises in a language that I didn't understand, but I, I knew the, the meanings of the songs. They didn't have to interpret them. They were just lifting up their praise to God, thanking him for, for being a great God. And, and I stood outside that church and, and just wept. Probably the first time in my life that I ever cried uh, that wasn't related to physical pain. And you know why I cried? Because I listened to them singing and I realized they love Jesus more than I did. They love Jesus more than me. You see, I'd come there pitying them for their, their lack of electricity and their lack of, uh, of housing. They're living in stick and mud and, and thatched roof houses. Uh, you know, uh, they had no paved roads. They had no electricity. They had no running water. They had no plumbing This was real poverty, and I thought, oh, how sad. And you know what I realized? That they were blessed more than me. Because all the wealth that we have, all of the stuff that we enjoy, all the modern conveniences and the comforts of our life, what they showed me was I just got in the way. That gets in the way, because a lot of times we love the gifts more than the gift giver. And I had to repent 
on that Kenyan bush kind of place and just go, God, I am so sorry. I want to love you as purely as these people love you. I don't want the stuff. I don't want the trappings. I don't want all the comforts to get in the way. I just want to be able to sing praise as purely as them. So I close with this question again. And I pray that it haunts you all week. Do you really want Jesus or just what Jesus can give you? Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. I will satisfy your soul. Let's pray. Father, today we we thank you for your love that does not let us go. We thank you for the security that we have in Jesus Christ. And, And Lord, we repent. We just confess that so many times we... We become enamored with the blessings and we forget about the one who blesses. And Lord, we confess that sometimes we complain about your blessings because they're, you know, we don't think that they're enough or they're not the right size or the color or taste or texture or, or what we want at the moment. And today, Lord, we just lay all that aside and we just tell you that we want you. Teach us how to to see past all of the things and all of the stuff and just to see you. Open our eyes in a new way that we can grab hold of you and love you and feast upon your goodness because you're the bread of life. Lord, we confess today that we need you and we ask that you would meet us here in a powerful and life-changing way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.